first shot, um, the First World War Military History Collection at the State Library of Victoria. I'm going to focus mostly on the Australian material, but as I start talking, you'll hopefully realise that we have um, a very, very broad collection indeed. In this centenary year of the Gallipoli campaign in 1915, the attention given to Australia's military history has been both broad and substantial, with activities and events at local, state and national levels. The State Library, for example, has mounted an exhibition covering Victorians at the war, and many local groups have um, also done their bit. This, um, this particular item caught my attention um, quite unexpectedly. Uh, this issue of the Airedaler is in memory of the many Airedale Terriers who gave their lives in World War I. This is the, um, uh, the Airedale Terrier Club of Victoria. Kind of like this one. The Great War had a profound effect on all involved and its effects ripped and rippled through the 20th century, making, I believe, our commemoration of this war more complex and more meaningful for those willing to explore their history. As part of the centenary commemoration, I would invite you all to share in the rich military um, history collection of World War I material that is a legacy of a decision taken 100 years ago by um, the trustees of the, uh, of the State Library. In the 1915 annual report of the library, they were half a page in those days, um, a decision was taken by the trustees to make, and I quote, a special collection of books on the European war. And they have already obtained several hundred volumes and pamphlets. The section devoted to the war will doubtless be one of the largest in the library. This brief comment resulted in the establishment of one of the best World War I collections um, in Australia, with the seriousness of intent demonstrated by the fact that the State Library was apparently receiving some German publications via Switzerland um, till sometime in 1916. This historical decision is not well known and, apart from some military historians, Few people know the true extent of the World War I collection. I will be clear from the beginning that we are not talking of uh, soldiers' service records um, and military campaign records, operational um, records. These are not published. Um, what we have um, are you know, battalion diaries and a few other things that are being copied, perhaps, but um, those records are as part of the, the previous talks, the um, National Archives and the Australian War Memorial. The State Library of Victoria collection is a large, diverse collection, including mostly published histories, military manuals, pamphlets, newspapers, journals, government reports, and a variety of manuscripts, um, maps, and pictures. The State Library of South Australia and the State Library of New South Wales um, also have wonderful collections of World War I material. But the major difference is, I believe, that the State Library of Victoria collection of Australian material is in context, as we try to collect the war as a whole. The major part of the World War I collection is the British and Allied material on the war, as well as some accounts from um, non-participating countries such as Sweden. We actually have a multi-volume set of you know, the Swedish history of the war. Unfortunately, all I can do is scratch the surface of the collection, so I will follow a few threads that hopefully indicate the richness proposed by the trustee's statement of 1915. As well as material specifically about the war years, the library also holds material on the post-war years and the enormous problems faced by soldiers and their families after they returned. Post-war euphoria and the heady taste of victory 
um, somewhat overshadowed the substantial medical, social and psychiatric problems caused by the massive disruptions of the war. Some of this material was published at the time, um, but a good deal was published much later and some areas were not well covered till recent years. Um, David Holloway, who spoke this morning, um, made a brief mention of this particular um, issue and uh, this was a recent publication. The Secrets of the Anzacs, the untold story of venereal disease in the Australian Army, 1914 to 1919 by Raiden Dunbar, published just recently in 2014. Um, according to several, I haven't read the book myself, but according to several reviews of the book, at least 60,000 soldiers contracted VD. There were, in fact, only 60,000 deaths in, in, in the war um, amongst the Australians. Amongst other things, the book deals with the social effects after they returned, as well as the toxic effects of the cure, as there was no penicillin in those days. Much of the cure was um, mercury-based, if I remember correctly, and rather nasty. Most of these soldiers were neither bad nor immoral. Um, they were just ordinary young men in a war. On the other hand, Peter Stanley does deal with the darker side of army life in bad characters. Sex, crime, mutiny, murder and the Australian Imperial Force, published in 2010. However, before we jump into the uh, deeper end of um, World War I history and its literature, um, I would like to start at the very beginning um, with one piece of World War I history that is a little surprising and indeed has not been well known until recently. This is a uh, newspaper account of the first shot fired after Britain declared war on the 4th of August. This was in the leader. There's also accounts in multiple other newspapers. It was apparently fired from Fort Nepean in Victoria, sending a shell across the bows of a German freighter, the SS Fultz, on the 5th of August, as it tried to leave Port Phillip Bay. As Melbourne is 10 hours ahead of Greenwich Mean Time, this is probably quite correct, as the shot was technically fired four hours after war was declared um, at 11 p.m. the previous night in London. This topic is covered by various pamphlets and the recent publication, Stop the Fults, 1914, the first British Empire action of World War I by Keith um, Quinton and others. I would like to imagine that as Victoria started the shooting war in this rather sad but historic manner, the decision to build a collection on the European war was done so in a determined fashion. I'm going to work through some of the groups of publications in general and will mention uh, a few in more detailed fashion to give you all an idea of the broad range of publications held by the library. As I indicated earlier, um, I can't cover everything. Um, so this will be an introduction to the rich resources um, available to all who use the library. I hope that those of you who have heard me speak on the general military history collection in the past, and I did speak here two years ago, um, will find some new and useful snippets of information to enliven your research. To begin at the beginning, most people who served during World War I end up as members of a military unit. Um, like a battalion or a regiment, ship or a squadron. And at some stage, most of these units have a history published, either officially or unofficially. In the case of the Great War, most Australians served in the Army, with only very small numbers, relatively speaking, in the Navy or the Air Force, the Australian Flying Corps, as it was known at that point. Often this information um, is available with service records or via family history. So once we know the name of the unit, we can quickly check something like AIF Unit Histories of the Great War of 1914-18, um, published in 2011 by Ron Austin. 
This is a great place to start and the short book covers a wide range of units and is actually quite easy to use. It certainly covers naval and um, uh, air corps material as well as the army. The State Library holds copies of almost all published Australian and British unit histories of the Great War, especially the British ones published straight after the war, and has continued to collect the Australian material up to the present day. Strangely enough, not all units have published histories, and I can recall being stumped on several occasions in the past when I was asked for a particular battalion history. Neither the 8th nor the 36th, for example, had published histories until quite recently. With the 36th history, Carmichael's Thousand, Their Triumphs and Their Trials, a history of the 36th Battalion AIF by Margaret A. Clark, only being published in 2014, 96 years after the unit was disbanded. When last I did a major check in 2010, there were five battalions without histories, and this was confirmed in Ron Austin's book, the one I mentioned just earlier. As you can see from the 36th new history, we've had a bit of a catch up, most likely due to the centenary. In another piece of little known history, I remember being surprised to learn years ago um, that the troops sent to New Guinea in 1914 were a completely separate unit um, and not related to the AIF units that later served overseas. Australia raised the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force, the ANMEF, which has been mentioned several times in, in earlier talks. Um, this unit consisted of about 1,500 army and naval troops and it uh, went first to New Guinea in an armed military capacity and faced action from some of the German forces before then functioning as occupation troops. After the German surrender in New Guinea, some of the ANMEF troops returned to Australia and separately enlisted in the AIF. As well as a number of pamphlets on this expedition, we also hold a substantial work, Australia versus Germany, the story of the taking of German New Guinea. This was actually published in 1915. A quick check of the library's um, catalogue for Australian regimental histories shows that we have over 180 entries, including um, multiple copies of various um, histories and reprints. There are also over 200 entries for British units and almost all published histories um, in the early post-war years were acquired. As well as regimental histories, the library also acquired most of the available brigade and divisional histories, such as Over the Top, with the 3rd Australian Division by G.P. Cutrus, with an introduction by Sir John Monash, originally published in 1918 or 1919. Almost all the individual battle or unit histories mention names, and many list awards and casualties. The writing, however, varies enormously, with many of the earlier histories clearly written for the men themselves, while the more recently published um, publications take a more general and conventional approach to the history of the units. In any case, we can check the order of battle for how the AIF was organised during the war and which units served um, in the brigade and divisional structures. If we use order of battle of divisions, part 5A, um, the divisions of Australia, Canada and New Zealand and those in East Africa, um, we can then track down and find out which brigade a battalion was assigned to, which division that particular brigade was assigned to, which battles that division then fought in, who the commanding officers were, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite a good publication if you want to trace the history of a particular battalion. 
We also hold the multi-volume British Order of Battle as well, um, as well as the recent publication on the French Army, Pour de la France, a guide to the formations and units of the land forces of France, 1914 to 18, by Michael Cox and Graham Watson. To the best of my knowledge, um, I think we're the only people that hold this, this item in Australia, and in fact, there have barely been any um, order of battle publications for the French Army, um, in, certainly in the last hundred years that, that I've checked. Keeping in mind that some units did not publish a history, it has been heartening to see a steady new trickle of histories appearing over the last 10 or 15 years, as well as some from even earlier that have helped fill in the gaps. Several authors have worked hard um, to fill in th these, this area, and I'll mention two works by Ronald J. Austin and Sue Austin, um, published in this recent time frame. Um, cyclists were actually, I think, mentioned by um, David Holloway as well. Uh, this is one, um, Cycling to War, History of the AIFNZ Cyclist Corps, 1916 to 1919, um, published in 2008. Um, and this one, I kind of like the title, The Body Snatchers, The History of the Third Australian Field Ambulance um, by Sue Austin and Ron Austin. Uh, this was originally published in 1995, but I think it's been reissued since then. A range of extended histories that may cover the two world wars or even longer time periods complements the publication of um, solely First World War type histories. A great example of this type of publication is Vets at War by Ian M. Parsonson, covering the history of the Australian Army Veterinary Corps um, between 1909 and 1946. I'm uh, fairly sure that the vets would have looked after any Airedales the AIF had on the books in either of the two world wars. Having mentioned this book, I should also confirm that we hold a history of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, 1796 to 1919, by Sir Frederick Smith, published 1927, and its companion volume, The History of the Royal Army Veterinary Corps, 1919 to 1961, by J. Clabby, published in 1963. Um, I believe that the third in the series, covering 1962 to 1995, um, has just been published in the UK this year. I specifically mention um, these titles as I was asked a question on military vets at the last time I spoke at um, Family History Feast. At this point, after speaking of the Veterinary Corps, we should mention that there were 15 Australian Light Horse Regiments in the AIF. And while almost all have individual histories, and we know one um, by David Holloway, who mentioned it this morning, um, the few that don't are covered by a range of other publications, such as this particular one. Um, oh, I haven't got this one, sorry. Uh, uh, Light Horse, a history of Australia's mounted arm by Jean Bou, um, a Cambridge University Press publication in 2009. This is a rather iconic photo of Australian light horsemen. Indeed, there are over 70 titles in our catalogue covering the Palestine campaign, um, where most of the light horse units served during the war. But it wasn't only light horse units in these campaigns. George and Edme Langley's 1976 publication, Sand, Sweat and Camels, the Australian companies of the Imperial Camel Corps, is a good reminder that Australians got around and served in all sorts of capacities during the war. Whichever way you look at it, the vets had a lot of animals to look after. Probably 8,000 horses, plus large numbers of remounts, just for the uh, 15 light, light horse regiments, not to mention the donkeys, camels, and probably anything else that could pull carts or carry supplies. The vets were certainly kept busy, 
And at this point, we should also perhaps mention that we have Jill Mavers, um, Gallipoli's War Horses, from the Dardanelles to Damascus, 1915 to 1918, on the history of the Australian whaler horse, very famous. Um, it was published as a centenary edition last year. I believe that most of us would be aware of the book, the film, or the play based on the war horse story by Michael Morpurgo. This type of popular history has certainly sharpened awareness of the animals that were often savagely used by all sides during the war. As a bit of trivial information, Britain had procured close to 600,000 horses and 213,000 mules, as well as almost 60,000 camels and oxen by the middle of 1917. Australians also served well beyond Palestine. And we are reminded of this in books such as The Desert Anzacs, The Forgotten Conflicts in the Deserts of Mesopotamia, North Africa and Palestine by Barry Stone, recently published in 2014. And um, another one with Horse and Morse in Mesopotamia, the story of the Anzacs in Asia edited by Keist Burke and published in 1927. This latter book covers, and I quote from the preface, and there was a question asked about um, Indian um, army nurses, uh, or Australian army nurses in India earlier, so listen to this one. Uh, I quote from the preface, this covers the histories of the first Australian pack wireless signal troop, the New Zealand wireless signal troop, the first Australian and New Zealand wireless signal squadron, the first cavalry divisional signal squadron, the light motor wireless sections, the Australians of Dunster Force, Persia and Russia, and the Australian nurses in India. A nominal role of all Australians who served in the Middle East as well. Quite an interesting book. It's, it's dated, but it's, it's quite interesting. I mention these works, um, as some of you may be aware of the Australians in the British Dunster Force exhibition, uh, expedition um, into Persia and Russia. And we do, of course, have Dunsterville's own account, The Adventures of Dunster Force, um, by L.C. Dunsterville, published in 1920. Um, I'll speak of the Australians in Dunster Force again a little later when I um, mention newspaper reports. Continuing with the Middle East just a little longer, I would like to point out that some areas are not at all well covered with published histories. As most of you would be aware, the front lines um, or the front line armies are supported by vast numbers of troops behind the lines to keep the battalions supplied, provide medical support, build and run camps, railways and most other things required to keep hundreds of thousands of men in the field. I'm not aware of any Australian Army Service Corps history in print, the First World War, but we do hold titles such as the British work, a history of the transport services of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, 1916, 17 and 18. By G.E. Badcock, published in 1925. There's lots of stuff on camels, donkeys, horses and motor vehicles in this particular book. Works like this one and a number of others on the Palestine campaign show aspects of the war that are hardly imaginable. To take the war into Palestine, the Allies had to organise and run massive transport structures that did not previously exist. They had to build not only a railway through the desert to ferry supplies for several divisions, including cavalry and light horse, the Sinai Military Railway, but they, had, um, they also had to build a pipeline to pump enough water to keep thousands of men and horses alive. So that's a, if you're interested in the history, it's actually quite complex and there's a bit more to it than what you might read in, in just a, a, a straightforward history of a particular unit. 
If some areas of our military history are a little thinly represented, um, the library will, however, often hold large numbers of other publications that usually give an excellent, if slightly more general, history of a particular unit or a military arm. The AFC, the Australian Flying Corps, uh, is a good example of this type of coverage, as the four squadrons only have brief or partial histories, um, backed by a large list of other publications and general histories, such as Fire in the Sky, the Australian Flying Corps in the First World War, by Michael Molketon, published in 2010. A quick look at our catalogue will show at least 30 works on the Australian Flying Corps or memoirs about time served with the various units. Sappers, tunnelers, ambulance, medical, signals, naval and artillery units have the same sort of mixed bag histories with the odd gaps. I was particularly pleased to see um, the ABC screen Anzac Girls um, a couple of years ago, as we now have a growing collection of memoirs and histories on the Australian Army Nursing Service that will, hopefully, go some way towards correcting Gwen Robinson's 1989 publication title, The Forgotten Women, Personal Accounts of Australian Nurses Abroad in World War I. We do, of course, um, have a copy of More Than Bombs and Bandages, um, Australian Army Nurses at Work um, in World War I by Kirsty Harris, um, as well as more than 20 other historical or biographical works on Australian nursing in the Great War. There's lots more information if you dig deeper, and some of you may remember that I mentioned the book With the Scottish Nurses in Romania, by Yvonne Fitzroy, published in 1918, when I spoke um, a few years ago. Another area often overlooked in military histories is the issue of POWs, prisoners of war. And the library holds a substantial collection of published memoirs, mostly British, but also some Australian. This title by John Yarral, um, published in 2011, gives a good overview of how prisoners were treated and the political background of the then recently um, agreed Geneva Conventions. Barbed wire disease, British and German prisoners of war, 1914 to 1919. Having emphasised some of the uneven coverage of the war, we must, however, um, remember that Charles Bean oversaw the um, writing of the 12 volumes of the official history of Australia in the war and that there were three more um, on medical services and these give a very thorough coverage of all military activities including aspects of the home front covered in the last volume. Although the library has copies of most major official histories including the British, the French and the German I would point you in the direction of the Australian War Memorial, um, where the Australian official history has been digitised for some years and is freely available on the internet. Strangely, while the French, German and Austrian official histories are also available digitally, if you could understand um, French or um, German, um, the British volumes are restricted to volume one in electronic form. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm looking in the, in the wrong place, but I certainly haven't been able to find the other volumes. We have them in print form, of course, so if you wanted to visit the library, you can certainly read whichever volume you need here. If I were to research a particular battle, I would certainly want to check the official history accounts and compare them with the range of publications we have on um, the specific battles and campaigns. And for quick information, I would look at some of the range of encyclopedias we have on the war. And we've got a few, and we've got some on very specific um, battles. Some famous battles can, however, be tricky, with the Gallipoli and Dardanelles um, campaign covered by over 700 books, reports, and pamphlets in our catalogue, 
ranging in date from 1915 to 2015. As part of this collection, we also have access to the database of all issues of the Gallipolian, published by the British Gallipoli Association. Most of you will probably um, remember that the Gallipoli campaign, the, the Dardanelles campaign, was largely a British and French um, venture, and the Australians played a part in this larger um, military um, campaign. Strangely, the AIF's um, greatest triumph, the Battle of Amiens in late 1918, is covered by less than 20 books in our collection, and we hold almost all the major publications. This particular title from our catalogue is a good summary um, for those of you not familiar with the importance of um, this particular battle, the Battle of Amiens. The day we won the war, turning point at Amiens, 8th of August, 1918, by Charles Messenger, 2008. If you are not sure where the trenches at Amiens were, you can always ask to view some of our World War I maps. Um, and while the collection is not as large as some, um, it's quite good and some of the maps are now slowly being digitised. We also have a map of the trenches at Gallipoli, um, and this one is digitised. And the map collection takes us to the outer limits of our collection, where on top of the 700 odd items on the Dardanelles mentioned above, we also have, on the one hand, diaries from soldiers that served in Gallipoli, and on the other hand, through our British Parliamentary Paper series, the final report of the Dardanelles Commission, tabled in the British Parliament in 1919. We have this published separately as well, but it was originally tabled as a, as a British Parliamentary report. The, um, these parliamentary papers are a complete electronic series, accessible from home, of 200 years of British parliamentary papers and Hansard records. Um, and they include all released War Cabinet documents for the 1914-18 um, war years and beyond. This title is another that may be of interest to some of you. Report of the War Office Committee of Inquiry into Shell Shock, tabled in 1922. Moving from this larger British parliamentary canvas of history to the more local and personal level, the Australian and British newspapers are a wonderful resource um, for both history of the war years and biographical and family history. I would like to pop up a few items from the war years as examples of what can be found. This one um, is a fairly simple report on um, awards to nurses. Some are actually quite long and have some biographical, some personal information about the nurses in them. This one, was, I just put it up because it was actually readable and um, quite short. Um, this one's a bit hard to read. Mr. Uh, the sec it's basically the second paragraph down the bottom that I would... Um, Hang on, I can use my, that one there. Mr T.J. Lane, the Geelong station master and formerly of Colac, has been invited to proceed to Melbourne to be publicly presented by the Governor-General with the Belgian Croix de Guerre, which was awarded to his late son for bravery in the Polygon Wood Battle in September of last year. So there's a foreign award that was presented here in Australia. I mentioned the Dunster Force expedition um, into Persia and Russia. They actually got as far as the Black Sea. This is a uh, report from um, September 1919, published in Melbourne, and um, this, this one is, was picked up by the Mercury in Hobart. It is proposed to release the troops of the Anzac Wireless Squadron, who are still on duty in Mesopotamia, not later than October the 13th, whether or not relieving troops have arrived to replace them. The remaining members of the North Persian force 
are being repatriated almost immediately. These are the remaining Australians who formed a portion of the Dunster Force, which did magnificent work in Persia and reached the Black Sea. And my final little newspaper report here, um, I kind of like this one. Um, this was in the Observer in, from Adelaide. Dogs, the war dogs. France is now occupied with a demobilisation of the dogs of war. There have been no fewer than 15,000 of them in service, and of these, about 3,700 have fallen in action or died in what are called the Blue Cross hospitals. The report goes on to describe, you know, how the dogs were being demobilised and, you know, where they were being used now. An unusual little item. I hadn't expected to find that. In conjunction with the National Library, um, we have digitised almost all Victorian newspapers for the war years, beginning with the complete run of the Argus and including most local and regional papers such as the Ballarat Star and the Colac Herald for 1914-18. Backing up the Australian papers is a complete electronic run of the Times of London from 1785 through to 2004. The papers are useful in searching for the posting of military decorations and awards, as we saw above. But the library also has almost all major works on medals awarded to Australians and on the history of military awards in general. Two good examples are mentioned in dispatches, Australians, World War I, compiled by George Newbery in 1988, and The Military Cross to Australians by Michael Mayton, um, 2004. Both of these publications are supported by the Australian Government Gazette issued during the war years, as well as the London Gazette where awards were first posted with a full citation if one was provided. We also have the recently published title for God and the Empire, the Medal of the Order of the British Empire 1917 to 1922 by Roger Willoughby. And this covers the Order of the British Empire, instituted in 1917, during the war, um, with the medal being awarded to a broad range of men and women for war work behind the lines and on the home front. We do, of course, also have medal books of non-British decorations, um, including works describing the German and Austro-Hungarian medals of the war. Indeed, some Australians were decorated by the French, the Belgians, as we saw earlier, um, and various other allies. And we do hold titles such as Pour la Marite, French Awards to Australians in World War I by Neil and Sylvie Smith. Having mentioned this, we should also mention that we have the complete Blue Max, a chronological record of the holders of the Pour la Marite, Prussia's highest military order from 1740 to 1918 by Kevin Brazier. If I remember correctly, um, both the Red Baron and Erwin Rommel, Field Marshal Rommel of the Second World War, uh, received this award in World War I. They both received the, uh, the Blue Max. Those of you interested in delving deeper into the Great War history, especially the Gallipoli campaign, can also follow up some of the books published recently by Turkish writers, including at least one Turkish officer's diary, translated into English, um, and a number of military accounts of the campaign from Turkish records and sources, such as Associate Professor Mesut Uyar's The Ottoman Defence Against Anzac Landing, 25th of April 1915, recently published in Australia, and Harvey Broadbent's Gallipoli, The Turkish Defence, The Story from the Turkish Documents, 2015. Given that we have such a large collection of regimental histories, um, I would hope that it doesn't surprise you to know that we also have some German battalion histories, um, including two in English about the List Regiment, Hitler's unit, 
as well um, as the 750-page histories of 251 divisions of the German army which participated in the war that was issued by the American Expeditionary Forces in 1919. It has little brief, brief you know, background accounts and descriptions of all the divisions, um, that, the German divisions that participated in the war. This last title is now available on the internet. Um, we've got a paper copy, of course, but it is available now on the internet. And, and it may be of interest to those wanting to research a little into the background of the soldiers the Australians were fighting in their various battles on the Western Front. Several other items should also be mentioned briefly, especially our First World War databases, um, except, ac uh, accessible from our website, and the great AJCP microfilm collections, the Australian Joint Copying Project um, collection. Some of you may be aware of this. Um, these are an absolute treasure trove. As an example, the collection includes the papers of British journalist Ellis Ashmead Bartlett, who provided many eyewitness accounts of the Gallipoli campaign, toured in Australia in 1917, I believe, um, and he was most recently brought into popular focus in the Channel 9 miniseries Gallipoli. For those of you who saw it, you'll probably remember um, what he did. At the end of this section on the broader aspects of World War I military collection, we should finally mention one particular item um, to remind us that Australians served not only in distant lands, but occasionally served wearing different uniforms. Under friendly flags, Australians who served in the land, sea and air forces of allied nations in World War I by Neil C. Smith, published in 1998. At the beginning of this talk, I spoke briefly about the home front and the post-war years mentioning the issue of venereal disease and later the British government report on shell shock in 1922. These issues and a great many more are covered in a spate of recent publications on the Great War's returned veterans in books such as Shattered Anzacs, Living with the Scars of War by Marina Larson, 2009, Anzac Legacies, Australians and the Aftermath of War, edited by Martin Crotty and um, Marina Larson, 2010. The Dark Pocket of Time, War, Medicine and the Australian State, 1914 to 1935, by Kate Blackmore, 2008. And Living with the Aftermath, Trauma, Nostalgia and Grief in Postwar Australia, by Joy de Musi, um, put out in 2001. Some of these titles will only have a section on the First World War, but the selection as a whole throws light on aspects of the veterans' lives largely overlooked by the Anzac mythology. The home front during the war is an area rich in history that is only now being seriously examined in a broader fashion. And most of us um, would be aware, at the very least, of the political and social drama posed by the conscription referendums in 1916 and 1917. If you go through our catalogue, we actually do have many of the pamphlets you know, that were put out um, on both sides, for and against, um, during those war years. And we have you know, the returns and you know, the, the various accounts of, of what actually happened. Home Front, Australians in World War I, researched and written by Craig Wilcox in 2011, and Robert Bollard's refreshingly provocative In the Shadow of Gallipoli, The Hidden History of Australia in World War I, open a number of different windows on our history. One collection that is... Um, rarely mentioned um, in the histories is the huge output of music and patriotic songs during the war. And I will briefly um, mention that we have several hundred pieces of sheet music and have recently acquired many more. Many of these have yet to be catalogued, so it would be worth talking to library staff if you're interested. 
Um, and having said this, um, we also have some recordings, including World War I, 1914-18, original sound recordings of the era, 1914-18, and popular songs from this epoch, the um, Anzac traditions. This was a double CD set put out in 2014. Um, and earlier mentioned Dawson, who was um, playing during the break. And of course, I, I, I'm not sure, but I think there might be a Dawson piece on, um, on this as well. There's another one. I quite like this one. There's also this one, Australia Forever. I will um, finish here by saying that the State Library staff have also built a very good collection of family history-oriented aids on tracing war ancestors, with over 100 published books, as well as a First World War research guide put together by one of our staff members on our website. This material is well worth um, checking, and you should talk to our family history staff on duty here at the library if you need some assistance. The final word, however, will show that our canine friends, introduced at the beginning of this talk, served in more ways than you might imagine. Thank you. <laughs>